Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we are going to have a relatively brief uh, webinar on tracking lead quantity and quality. Just because it's short doesn't mean it's not going to be packed with a ton of valuable information. I'm really excited about today's webinar. And without further ado, let's dive in. Uh, a couple quick housekeeping items. If you do have questions, please do post into the chat. You can do that whether you're live streaming this out on one of the socials or whether you're coming in through the Zoom meeting. Either way, I'll get to those questions at the end. And um, a copy of these slides will be emailed to you. If you're coming in the live stream and you didn't register for this, uh, there'll be a QR code you can scan at the end to get those slides. So no need to be scrambling to try and, try and take screenshots. A little bit about me. My name is Steve Robinson. I'm the founder and CEO here at Brilliant Metrics. Um, uh, my career has spanned uh, software development all the way through to marketing. Last 20 years or so, I've been in marketing. In addition to the workshops and speaking that I do through Brilliant Metrics, I also do teach at UWM School of Continuing Ed. A little bit about Brilliant Metrics. We are a B2B digital marketing agency. Uh, our focus is on helping our clients get from uh, where they're at today to where they could be tomorrow. We call that walking up the mar marketing maturity model. And it's really what sets us apart from other digital agencies out there. On to today's agenda. So today we're going to cover the what we mean when we talk about lead quantity and quality and why tracking both is important. We'll go through the four dispositions for a lead, the four ways you can treat a lead. Um, we'll talk about how to make sure that get that feedback, feedback loop in place in a way that is easy to follow and uh, uh, implement. And then um, we'll talk about some of the automatic actions you can do when you get that lead feedback in place, as well as how to interpret the data. So you get all this feedback in, what do you do with it? So diving in, when we talk about lead quantity and quality, um, it's really important to track both of these metrics separately. There really isn't a magic way to combine them in a way to come to one, one number on winning as far as lead generation goes. Instead, you're really looking at the uh, you're you're looking at the quality of your leads over time, as well as the quantity of those leads. Now, if I wanted to just game the system and max out lead quantity, I could do the 2023 equivalent of opening the phone book and ripping out pages, and that is to go to Zoom Info and just download a list of leads and hand them to sales and say, "Here you go. I hit my lead 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 target for the year. Here's uh, 250 leads." But that's not going to do sales a whole lot of good. They're calling on just random people at that point, right? Conversely, if I wanted to make sure that I was maxing out quality, I could run every lead that comes in through some 50-point lead check, make them fill out a form that you know makes them incredibly qualified before they hit go, and only hand to leads, only hand to sales those one or two leads that are just perfectly qualified. But I'm not going to hit my goals that way either. So the goal is to hit the sweet spot in between these two extremes, right? You don't want to max out your quantity in, in, in exchange for really low quality leads. You don't want to max out your quality in exchange for just a trickle of, of leads throughout the year. You want to hit the sweet spot between the two of them. The only way to know if you're hitting that sweet spot, though, is to get a feedback mechanism in place. So if you don't measure both lead quantity and quality accurately, you end up leading to optimizations that optimize for one or the other, but never both. And you end up in this yo-yo where we, this month we introduced an optimization that increased the quantity, but the quality went through the floor. Next month, we do something backwards the other way. The key is to continuously measure both at all times. The way that we uh, get feedback on leads is we ask our we ask sales to put leads into one of four dispositions: good, bad fit, bad timing, or junk. And it wouldn't be a good webinar if we didn't have a nice two by two grid. And so we'll talk through um, these four dispositions in this two by two grid now. If something is good, that means it it has a contact and company fit, meaning that the person who is coming through as a lead, because a lead is generally a human being, not just an uh, not just a company. But if there is a person coming through with that lead, that person is in a role that they could champion the deal all the way through to fruition. It also means the company that they work for is uh, on target as well. This is an industry we can serve. 
um, a market we can serve. This isn't some some something that's way off the reservation from from where we do business. Um, it also means that they have an immediate need or some some scent of intent. They have a need that we can fulfill. This isn't just somebody on a fact finding mission or tire kicking. If they meet all of those criteria, that's a good lead. It's in the upper left-hand corner of this quadrant. The second disposition is bad timing. Here we meet the first two. It's the right type of person. They could champion a deal through. And they work for the right kind of company. But after talking to them for five minutes, I don't think there's actually a deal here. Nobody has actually given them a approval on this project, or this is something that's, you know, they're thinking about doing two years from now, or maybe this is just somebody who is trying to answer a question that's ancillary to the, the, the core value that we provide. Um, that puts them in this bad timing category here. The third category is bad fit. This is where, um, yeah, they have a need, but we really don't want to sell to them because either they're too small or it's the wrong industry, or um, there's something you know culturally wrong with that company that we don't want them as a customer. Um, whatever it could be, we don't want to market to these folks really anymore. We don't want any more leads that look like this. And then the final category is junk. This is somebody who doesn't meet any of the criteria. Usually this is spam. We get students who are filling out forms, looking for information. Um, we'll get uh, some some. Uh, it's usually one of those two categories. Sometimes there's people trying to sell to you, filling out your forms. Um, those are all, all are just junk and we want to make sure that minimize those to the best of our ability altogether. So how do you get sales to provide one of these four dispositions? Well, we have worked out a continuous loop of a workflow here. So if you think about it, you're engaged in certain marketing activities. Those marketing activities should be resulting in interactions. They're either interacting on the website or they're interacting in the ads themselves. Some of those interactions are going to uh, result in a prospect taking some sort of an action that makes them a lead. Now, that could be like the straw that broke the camel's back from a, a scoring perspective. It's the last thing they did that pushed that, that, that lead across a scoring threshold. Or it could be that they filled out a form. Maybe it's a form embedded directly in a social ad or a form on your website. Um, but it, it, it pushed them directly into a lead status because they raised their hand and said, I want to buy what you're selling. Either way, the prospect has taken an action that results in them becoming a lead. At that point, you have to route that lead. You have to alert sales that they have a lead to follow up on. And so you're going to send them an alert that says, hey, John Doe at Widget Co. needs, needs something. Can you follow up with them? Or it looks like they need something. Can you follow up with them? That alert might look something like this. So uh, a couple of key things to make a really good sales alert. First of all, always put the name of the lead in the subject line. Uh, that that accomplishes two things. One, the sales team can go find that email pretty quickly and go and quickly click in to go and see the person in, in Salesforce or whatever CRM. But two, if you've got a threading email platform, it doesn't make all the leads stack up underneath one thread. Two, always have a link to the CRM in your email. Now we send our emails through our marketing automation platform, which means we need to generate that URL for, for CRM inside of marketing automation. That's not necessarily that hard to do. Usually you can just, it's, it involves putting the ID of that, of that contact or, or lead record in the CRM system in the right place in a URL. So always have a button to, to open in, in the marketing on, or I'm sorry, in the CRM platform. And then finally, include those feedback buttons right inside the email. Give the person to uh, the opportunity after they followed up with that lead to just go back to that email and quickly click a button to say whether that, that lead was good bad timing, bad fit, or junk. If they don't click those buttons within three days, well, remind them. So we will set up a reminder email that'll go out after those three days. It looks very similar to that lead email, except um, we've pulled those buttons up towards the top and uh, we're just reminding them why we're asking for this feedback. The key thing is to make it fast and easy. And so if somebody does click one of these feedback buttons, the way that we've architected it is that that click goes to the marketing automation platform to a landing page, which 
auto submits a form. So there's a hidden form on that page that includes whatever button they clicked. And then that updates a field in the database with that leads last feedback value. So now we can go and pull a list of contacts that were recent, uh, recent leads and sort them by uh, which of these statuses was last provided and be able to run some analysis. Now, if they don't provide that feedback, we wait three days and then just put them in a loop. It's an endless loop of feedback request. Wait three days. Do we have a feedback? Nope. Okay, put them back. Feedback request. And you might think that that's kind of overkill, right? Why are we going to continue to harass and barrage our sales team asking them for feedback on these leads? But the reality is that if you don't do that, you end up with a situation where you introduce bias into the leads that you do get the feedback on. Think about Amazon reviews. Like, when have you left an Amazon review? You've probably left an Amazon review only when that product like really knocked your socks off and you wanted to share it. But more likely you left an Amazon review when that product lets you down. Um, most of us aren't really apt to provide feedback if it's if things are just good, not great, right? So by by forcing this feedback loop, you don't bias your feedback towards the leads that sucked or um, the couple that were really good. Now you're going to get consistent feedback on every single lead that you send across the wire to sales. The analogy I like to use is imagine if the batter got to pick which of the, uh, the pitcher's pitches actually counted towards the pitcher's stats. It doesn't make any sense. You need to make sure every single lead gets counted in your analysis. And the best way to do that is to force this um, literally infinite feedback loop. So we have feedback. Great. What do we do with it? Well, we take it, we analyze it, and we improve the marketing activities in the front end. And by doing this, we introduce continuous improvement to our marketing and our lead generation program. Now, I mentioned we do this through our marketing automation platform. Um, Modic is the one that we generally recommend for small businesses and mid-market. And then Enterprise, we've done this with Marketo. But in both cases, we can take follow-on activities automatically when somebody fills out that or clicks the, that button and indicates what that lead status is. And so um, those automatic actions help us keep the database clean and keep us marketing to the right people and prevent some of those bad fits from popping back up again. So if somebody comes, if a, if a lead comes back as good or bad, just bad timing, we don't really need to do anything automatically. We just need to continue marketing to that lead. Um, that's a good lead. Keep marketing to it. Now, maybe we could change up the contents of that marketing if we really wanted to get sophisticating, to, sophisticated to the stuff that's going to help a sale close if it's a good one. But in general, we don't do anything. We just keep the marketing engine on for those ones. If something comes through as a bad fit, though, at that point, we don't want to take them out of the database because they'll just fill out a form and come back into the database again. Instead, we want to keep them in the database and mark them as marketing suspended or bad fit or some other designation like that. By doing so, we can A, prevent them from being popping back up as a lead again, um, uh, especially if it's a scored lead situation. And, and B, we can shut off any you know, digital marketing that we're doing that's based on that CRM record. So we pull them out of any CRM targeted paid media. We stop email marketing to them. Um, we prevent them from uh, uh, receiving any more marketing than, than, than they're going to come across just in their daily life. And if it's junk, well, we delete the record from the database. Now, we'll usually put a delay on this just to make sure that we aren't, you know, somebody clicks that button by accident, they can contact us and say, hey, we, we clicked a junk, but on a perfectly good lead, make sure don't delete that. Um, you need to make it clear to the salespeople that if they click junk, it's going to delete the record from the database because they may not know that. Um, but if you do that, this is a great way to keep um, the spam form fills and and some of the junk out of your database and just get it out of there right away. So that's the automated actions. But we talked about that feedback loop introducing continuous improvement. So how how does the how does that work? How do we analyze the results? Well, let's say I'm getting the results back and I 
pretty universal across the rest of the three the three categories, but my good leads seem lower than they ought to be, or I just want to increase them. Well, I can pop into the records that have come across as good leads and take a look at their history. Again, we're doing this through marketing automation. So the history of every digital touch point that we've logged in the marketing automation platform. So now we can see what did they do? What did the good ones do? And can we make sure that we do more of that? And what's missing? What are we expecting to be on that path of a good lead that doesn't show up here? We can take a look at the sources of traffic. Where do those good leads get introduced to the website? And can we amp up investment in those sources? What sources of traffic are we not seeing that we're kind of expecting to see there? Maybe we can pull back on those. And then finally, we can A-B test the stuff that does seem to be working to make it work even better and drive up more of those good leads. What do we do if we have a, a, a disproportionate amount of bad timing coming through? Well, this means that we're getting the right people, but it's false alarms essentially, right? So how do we reduce the false alarms? Well, we change what, what's triggering those, alar triggering those alarms. Usually this means taking, if you have a lead scoring program, this means taking a look at the lead scoring actions that you have set up in your marketing automation platform. You'll often find there are a couple of actions there that are overly tilting the, uh, the, the scales towards, towards people becoming uh, uh, MQLs that shouldn't be MQLs. Uh, an example uh, for, for us here at Brilliant Metrics, we had webinar attendance as a, as a signal and it was way too high of a score. And so we kept having people pop up as MQLs because they had attended you know, multiple webinars in a row. And that didn't mean that they, were, they had any intent to purchase. So we had to, we, we adjusted that scoring to, to turn that knob down a little bit. The other place you'll often see this is if you have a form that is considered a high intent form that routes directly to sales and that high intent form shouldn't be a high intent form. It shouldn't route directly to sales. That should just push people into a nurture. Um, well, we've often seen seen uh, marketing programs that we inherited with clients that that had that set up, where if somebody filled out this form to download this ebook, that lead got automatically sent off to sales. And of course, just because they downloaded an ebook didn't necessarily mean they they had intent. Now it depends on the topic of the ebook, but in many cases there was a lot of that gated content that wasn't high intent content, and those leads were being routed directly to sales. When that happens, you'll see a lot of bad timing. As for bad fit, um, usually this is where you're attracting the wrong people into your marketing program. Uh, so we'll see this where we've got some content on the website that maybe made a lot of sense for under a previous um, marketing strategy and doesn't make sense today, but it has a ton of organic search value. Well, you might not want to take that content off of the website because it's driving up your overall domain authority and helping you produce other traffic to your website and taking it off could really mess up your SEO, but we don't want those people to necessarily be leads. Well, you can set it up so that when people have visited those pages, you can actually create a negative lead score if you're running lead scoring, or um, you could flat out omit them in other cases, um, reduce the calls to action on those pages, and just try not to drive that traffic into lead territory. Sometimes we have a lot of bad fit because our paid media targeting is off. We're putting ads in front of the wrong people. Well, of course, then we get the wrong people coming through as leads. So take a look at where you're targeting your ads. Take a look at the traffic sources for those leads that are coming through that are, are bad fit. See where they came from and, and dial back on that investment. And then um, uh, uh, another way that you can influence the bad fit leads is, is to allow people to self-qualify. A lot of times we'll, we'll put a form up and we just want anybody and everybody to fill it out. But if we put some copy above the form and we put some copy into our offer and into our, into our ads and into, into the, 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 everything that we've got trying to drive traffic through this particular lead source that, that says this is for people in this industry, or this is for professionals at a certain level, or this, you know, this offer is specifically for this group. It does two things. One, the people in that group are going to be more attracted to it because it's, it's specifically for them. Um, but two, a lot of your bad fit traffic are going to be less attracted to it and less apt to fill out the form. 
It's not going to solve all your problems, but it will solve some of them. And finally, what I put out here crossed out, because this is what this is what we see more often than not, is you, you get sales complaining about garbage leads coming in, about people that are not qualified because they're bad fits. So then marketing goes and starts adding fields to the form to qualify the people filling out the form. So, you know, what is your project value? 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 or whatever it is. And anything that's under a certain value doesn't, doesn't go to sales. Um, that, that is not best practice. And the reason why it's not best, best practice is because when you do that, you force people to think about something to fill out that form that maybe they haven't thought about and they don't have the answer to in their back pocket. And then they just don't fill out the form. And so your lead quantity goes down significantly when you implement that tactic. Yes, your quality will go up. It will work for improving your lead quantity, quality, but you'll take a huge hit to your lead quantity if you just start trying to solve your bad fit problem by adding, adding qualifying fields to your forms. And as for junk... Not a ton you can do, but a couple of things you can do here. Look at the pages that they visited um, and 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 possibly add a negative lead score or, or, or tamp those down on calls to action. Similar to you do for bad fit. That'll cut out some of like the students that are filling out forms. Um, the other thing is you might just have a spam form, a form spam problem. And in that case, uh, uh, our go-to is a honeypot field. The way a honeypot field works is it's a field on the form that you can't see, um, but it's in the HTML. And most of the, the automatic form filler spam tools don't look at whether or not the form is visible. Um, and so they'll fill out every field because they want to make sure that it gets submitted and they'll fill out that honeypot field. So the spam bots will fill out the honeypot field. The humans won't. And all you have to do is throw away anything that filled out that form, filled out that field. Now you want to give it a name that makes sense to like a screen reader or something like that that says, leave this blank and then leave that, leave that field blank. And you'll find that you'll, you'll significantly reduce that form spam, not completely because some of them are smarter than, than that. And some of these are humans filling out these forms in, you know, some other country. Um, but you, you, you'll, you'll take out about 80% of it, which is enough to usually get people to stop complaining about the form span. So that's it. Like I said, today is really short and sweet. Um, uh, I, I think there really wasn't a whole lot of uh, more content to go over today. That does leave us with some extra time for questions. So if you do, um, if you do have uh, questions, please do post them into the chat. Uh, Elizabeth asks, you said it's not best practice to introduce a budget qualifier to lead forms. What other options do you have to make sure my sales team can focus on more qualified leads and not spin their wheels with these less qualified leads? Uh, what we're seeing with especially larger sales teams is a transition back from sales fielding leads directly to having marketing pre-qualify those leads before they go off to sales. That's additional headcount though. Um, the other thing is, can you have a, a more junior salesperson take those internet leads at first, qualify them, and then pull in, uh, maybe an account executive or somebody that is, is a little bit higher, you know, higher up in the totem pole in the sales organization, uh, simply filtering them out by forcing them to fill in a field is not, you, you, you kill your quantity more than you improve your quality. That does reduce that does increase noise, and you need to really figure out a system internally to handle that. The ROI is there almost every time. The amount you'll pay to have that human being go and sift through those leads, even if they're just taking a look at them and taking a look at the company that they work for and saying, that's too small, um, and sending them, I'm sorry, I'm I, I don't think we're going to be able to help you, uh, type of message back. Um, is uh, the ROI on that that headcount is is totally there because the upside is the bigger deals that you didn't get. Um, and then the other thing is, again, pre-qualify, allow people to pre-qualify themselves by putting the copy uh, around that form that says who, who a good fit here is. You know, we generally work with companies between this size and this size. Write that. You know, uh, most people don't like the idea of filling out a form just to be shot down. So you'll find you'll find that your traffic will your 
noise will drop and you'll just get more signal. And then uh, another question came in here. Are there any industry specific trends or benchmarks regarding lead quantity versus lead quality that we should consider? I don't know of any. Um, you know, if you have a peer group that you can join of other folks that are really in your niche of an industry, you might get some good stats from them. But what we find is it really depends on how you run your marketing and your sales organization. Every sales organization is different in their appetite for uh, higher quantity uh, at lower quality versus the other way around. Um, some sales organizations say, yeah, give me the low quality leads and I'll call on them because I'm, I'm happy when I run across that diamond in the rough and other sales organizations are like, they better be ready to buy right now with a big, a uh, big order, or I don't want to talk to them. You have to dial it in for your organization. And that's different for basically every client I've ever worked with. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any more questions here. So with that, please do follow us on LinkedIn if you haven't already. And uh, if any more questions do come up, my email will be in the thank you email. You're welcome to email me directly and you're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn as well. And with that, I hope everybody has a wonderful day.